In my previous video, I upgraded my network and home lab setup to make it a lot more organized and easy to use, but today, we're going to make it go fast. And on a decent budget. Now really quick, if you're watching this video, you're probably the type of person that puts a lot of thought into their hardware, software, configurations, but why not put that much thought into your charger? Well, maybe it's just because you haven't yet heard about the Nexode RG65 watt charger from Ugreen, the sponsor of today's video. This little guy might look cute, but it's capable of 65 watts of fast charging. It can charge 60% of an iPhone 15 in only 30 minutes, and in an hour, it can charge 70% of a MacBook Air. The top USB-C port can max out at 65 watts, but then you also get a second Type-C port and a Type-A port. This is great for making sure I can keep things charged like my Steam Deck, or my iPad, or really anything else I have around my house. Plus, that cute little face on the front actually tells you the state of the charger. Pretty cool. Ugreen was able to make this powerful charger so tiny by taking advantage of gallium nitride technology. This not only helps reduce energy usage, but also makes sure the Nexode stays nice and cool. If things do start to heat up, you don't need to worry. Ugreen's intelligent thermal guard technology protects your devices by automatically adjusting power levels in response to unusually high temperatures or output. If 65 watts is more than you need, you can also check out the Nexode RG30 watt, which has a single USB-C port capable of 30 watts of fast charging. If you're looking to step up your charger game, make sure to check out the link in the description to pick up your Nexode RT charger today. As the title and goofy intro suggested, we're going to be adding 10 gigabit networking to my home lab setup today, and we're hopefully going to do it on a decent budget. I've been wanting to add 10 gigabit networking for a while now, primarily so I can test out some different things and not be limited by my network, but it's also going to be great to have between my editing PC and my NAS to sort of speed up my editing workflow. For a while, I was kind of hesitant to get into 10 gigabit networking because you were either spending a lot of money or dealing with pretty old used enterprise hardware that could sometimes be finicky, it seemed. But there are actually a lot of great deals out there to get into 10 gigabit networking, like this little switch here. This is the QNAP QSW something, 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 the QSW 2104 2TA which has four RJ45 jacks, two of which are 10 gigabit and four are two and a half gigabit. Now, the really cool thing about this switch is that I believe it only costs around $140. Considering that like a year ago, it would cost me like $120 to get into two and a half gigabit switches, this is not bad. And this thing is pretty awesome. It's completely passive and only draws a few watts. I mean, the power supply is only 12 volts at one amp. Originally, I had planned to either buy two of these or buy one of these and then a slightly bigger version, but QNAP actually reached out and offered to send me over some switches. And they didn't want to send me this one because it's pretty cheap, I'm assuming, but they did send me the switch that you may have seen in my last video, which I'm not even going to try to say the model number because QNAP, your model numbers are pretty long. Now that switch is awesome. It has eight RJ45 ports that support 10 gigabit, but also support five, two and a half and one gigabit. It also has eight 10 gigabit SFP plus ports that also support SFP. This switch just launched and I don't think you can really find it anywhere yet, but as far as I can tell, the MSRP is right around $600, which is pretty expensive, but you get a lot for it. When rebuilding my home lab in the last video, I set it up and had absolutely no issues getting it started. And so far it has just run without a hitch. I've had no issues with auto negotiation on two and a half gigabit or one gigabit. And today we're going to test out 10 gigabit and see how it works. Now, I know I said this video was on a budget and yeah, $600 switch isn't necessarily on a budget, but like I said, my plan was originally just to get two of these and I think the idea still applies here. Now, along with that switch, QNAP also sent over one of their four bay NASs that I'll be taking a look at in a future video, but I will be setting that up today because it does include the optional 10 gigabit add-in card. But what about Nix for my editing PC and my TrueNAS server? Well, I did a little bit of looking on eBay and AliExpress, and first I bought this Broadcom two port 10 gigabit card that I found on eBay for pretty cheap, and I'm not even going to try to say the model number here. And these are a bit older and are meant to go in probably a 2U server, meaning they would get a lot of airflow, but I'm hoping that by only using one of these NICs, it'll run cool enough that we won't need to add any additional fans or anything. I also picked up another dual 10 gigabit NIC on AliExpress from Inspur, and once again, I don't really know a ton of the specs on this, but I believe this is supposed to be using the Intel X540-T2 
NYX. I may be getting that wrong, but yeah, I also picked this up for really cheap on AliExpress, so hopefully it works pretty well. Now, when I did my Zima Blade review, Ice Whale actually sent over this single 10 gigabit NIC so that I could test out the Zima Blade with 10 gigabit, and I did. So I really don't know how much this guy costs, and I hopefully won't have to use it. Hopefully I can get by with those other two cards, but it will be good to have as a backup just in case. All right, so we have our switches, we have our NICs. What about cables, though? You might be thinking, OK, are you going to use fiber or cat six? And no, I'm going to use cat 5e, or at least I'm going to try and use cat 5e. And I know you may be freaking out right now because technically, no, cat 5e is not rated for 10 gigabit, but I have a pretty short run between my network closet, which is on the other side of this wall, over to here behind my desk. And even though cat 5e isn't technically rated for 10 gigabit, over short distances, it can work. Actually, Techno Tim did a very similar video where he did 10 gigabit over cat 5e, and his cable run seemed to be much longer, so I'm feeling pretty confident. Now, the big boy 16 port switch that QNAP sent over is already racked up. I did that in my last video, but this guy is going to go over here under my little workbench. That way I can plug my PC into it, but also have it for testing other stuff. So let's go ahead and get that plugged in and see if we can get 10 gigabit. OK, so I'm over here at my desktop and I have the dashboard pulled up for our QNAP switch. The model number is QSWM3216R-8SAT. Super easy to remember, but super awesome still. And we can see that we have all of our ports here. And oh, looky there. Port number five is the one that this line between my network closet and my office is plugged into. And it auto negotiated to 10 gigabit. Now we haven't really probably had any packets over that, but we should be able to go to port management and then port statistics and errors. And so far, nothing. We'll go ahead and hit clear just to make sure so it auto negotiated to 10 gigabit. You can see I didn't have to go in here and enable this or anything or set it to a particular configuration. It just automatically negotiated it 10 gigabit. So pretty sweet. I think now I want to go ahead and see which one of these NICs are going to work in my desktop and which ones are going to work in the TrueNAS server. Hopefully they should work in everything, but I want to be sure. Now, I already did plug in this Broadcom NIC into my desktop because I used that when I tested out the Zima Blade. I just had a direct connection between this card and this little one that was actually plugged into the Zima Blade. So I'm going to try plugging in this Inspur that has the Intel X540-T2 NICs and make sure that one works. OK, so I got it plugged in, but it's not showing up in my network adapter here, which made me think maybe it's a driver thing. But even when I pull up Hardware Info 64, it doesn't show up anywhere in my PCIe bus. I did a little bit of looking around on the internet and it seems like some people have had issues with these working in some motherboards and not working in others, or maybe it's a software issue. I'm not really sure. I, it could be a driver issue, but to my understanding, if it doesn't even show up in Hardware Info 64, it's not a bad driver. It's just that the PCIe device isn't being seen at all. So not really sure. I'm going to try out this little guy that I used with the Zima Blade and see if that one shows up. OK, well, good news. If we hop in here to our network adapters, we now have another one here. And this looks like a Marvel AQ Shin Action. What the heck is that name? But hey, 10 gigabit network adapter. And I actually went ahead and plugged it into the switch. Let's see. Hey, it says 10 gigabit per second. So pretty cool. I think eventually I'm going to try swapping this Broadcom. Yeah, this Broadcom card back into this desktop. That way I have that little small NIC available and my desktop gets a decent amount of airflow from the front fan. So hopefully that'll be enough to keep this cool. There's plenty of heat sinks on here, it seems. We'll test that out. But for now, I'm just going to leave that hooked up. And I think I'm going to go try putting in this Inspur or Intel, whatever card, this one that didn't work in the PC into my TrueNAS server and see if that works. If not, then... I'm going to assume this card is a dud and we'll just have to move on. But yeah, let's go pop this into my TrueNAS server and see if that works. All right, so we're in my network closet here. It's really tight and really hard to film, but if we come all the way down, we have good old hard drive haven, my main NAS, which has actually been in this closet, just the door slightly cracked, and it's all stayed fairly cool. So like I mentioned in the first video, I do have some plans to make this closet a bit cooler. But yeah, for now I have this side panel off and I have some brackets removed because I'm going to try to drop in that 10 gigabit card and uh, see if we can make something happen here. Fortunately, this one already has the full size card on it. So uh, 
let's just go for it here. I'm gonna actually turn the power supply off before anything bad happens. Some beautiful cinematography here. You're welcome. Okay. I'm not gonna screw it all the way in until we know for sure that it works. But yeah, let's go ahead and turn it on and see what happens. So TrueNAS started up. I'm here in the dashboard. Here's my two and a half gigabit NIC and then EN01 and EN01 EN EN and EN02 are the two built-in gigabit NICs. But underneath that, we have ENP1SOF0 and ENP1S0F1. So it looks like those two NICs are recognized. And if I go into the shell, if I type in LSPCI, yeah, right here, we have Ethernet Controller Intel Corporation 10 gigabit x 540 8 T2, which is different than what I expected, but it's there. So hopefully it works. I think now what I'm gonna do is change up the interfaces here. So I'm accessing this via this bridge on this 10.41. And this is how I access it over my two and a half gigabit network. And this is all gonna be on the same network now, thanks to the 10 gigabit QNAP switch in my rack. But I want to still have two interfaces for TrueNAS. That way, if one of the, if this NIC fails for some reason, I can still access the web UI via this 10.41 address. So for now, I think I'm going to keep this NIC still on this 10.100.100.3, whatever. I might change that here in the future. I don't know exactly how I want to have this set up. But for now, I think I'm going to copy this IP address here and paste it in... Oof, I don't know which one. Let's just try it on one. We'll hit save. It didn't like that. Oh, it's because, okay, we're gonna copy this, get rid of it, hit save, and then we'll go to this first interface, paste by 16, hit save, and then we'll hit test changes and save changes because I'm not accessing this over that changed IP address. Now I think I'm going to actually plug the cable in and set up my 10 gigabit NIC here on the same subnet and see if I can't access it. All right, so in the big daddy switch here, I already have a cable for the, what was two and a half gigabit that's running down to it. I think I'm just gonna move that from the two and a half gigabit NIC. Oh, this is gonna be really hard to film. Okay, I decided it wasn't sure worth trying to film while plugging that cable in and accidentally pushing out the PCIe card because it's not screwed in. But as you can see, it is plugged in. It looks like up here we're getting a status LED. So that's good. Let's go check TrueNAS really quick. Okay, well, good news. First of all, I never get lucky and plug things into the right port, but I actually managed to plug it into the right port first time because you can see we have the updated IP address, but you can also see that this port is active. So nailed that. And then hopping back over to the QNAP dashboard, we can see that on port six, we're at 10 gigabit, which is pretty sweet. And if I go back to port management and statistics and errors, we still don't have anything just yet, which is good. But we haven't actually tried transferring any files, so let's try that. And so I'm in here in this test Plex library folder here where I just have some random videos and stuff for testing. And I'm gonna try just copying over this Samsung Wonderland whatever. Let's give it a shot. And okay, well that's more than two and a half gigabit. Nothing crazy not the one gigabyte or whatever we were expecting, but I have a feeling now it's going to be cached. And if I try it again, we'll hit replace. And there we go, 1.03 gigabytes per second. That is so much faster than it was before. Well, let's try writing. So if I copy this back here, hit replace. Okay, it slowed down a little bit, but you can see that caching there is it immediately ingest that file to, to RAM. I'm not, I'm not gonna talk like I understand TrueNAS that well. But yeah, if we try copying this back over, hit replace. Nothing super crazy there. I know for sure I'm being limited by my drives and probably the only 32 terabytes, oh my gosh, and probably only the 32 gigabytes of RAM I have in my TrueNAS server. I could probably benefit from upgrading that some. Let's try something like this Knives Out. This is a 21 gigabyte file. Yeah, so we're rocking this 450 to 500, somewhere around there, maybe a little lower. But yeah, this is probably the limitation of just the four mechanical hard drives I have in that NAS because it's nothing crazy. Now I guess I gotta spend more money on a fancy new NAS. Darn. I'm curious how hot this is getting. Okay, yeah, that's like burning my hand hot. So we'll probably need to sort that out. Okay, yeah, so this card 
got hot. It's even like kind of hot to the touch after shutting down the server and taking this out. So that's not good, but I happen to have a little 40 millimeter Noctua fan that I had for another project that didn't really happen. And uh, I also have some zip ties. So let's see if we can't make a little uh, active cooled card here. So it's gonna be a little hard to see from this camera angle. There's a lot of empty space where there's nothing underneath this heat sink. So I think I'm gonna try to run one zip tie underneath the heat sink. I'm just gonna start with that. I'm gonna run one all the way around from the fan underneath the heat sink to attach it to the heat sink. Let's see if that'll, uh, if that'll work. Well, okay, so it goes under. I kind of have a little loop here. I don't need it to be crazy tight or anything. Yeah, honestly, I could probably just roll with that one zip tie there. This kind of wobbles a little bit. I was gonna say I was gonna run a second one over here, just kind of around the back of the PCB, but I honestly think just this one zip tie, I mean, if I hold it like that, it's not sagging off or anything. And there's plenty of open fan headers on that system. So I think I'm just gonna try plugging this in and see what happens. I should probably clip off that though. All right, it's not perfect, but there's a fan on it. So let's go see if we can get this hooked up. All right, so it's in there. The fan kind of bumps up against the other two PCIe slots. So that's gonna limit some things I can do in the future. I might actually move it down to the very bottom slot at some point so it doesn't block off any other PCA slots, but I don't know if you can see it, but I have it plugged in way back there to one of the plethora of fan connectors on the Supermicro motherboard. And uh, let's power it on and see what happens. Here we go. Oh, power supply's off. Here we go. No loud screeching, no scratchy noises. It is in fact spinning. And so far this heat sink is cool to the touch. So I imagine that's gonna be plenty. Let's make sure it's still working. All right, so we've got it hooked back up. The fan's on, it's all working. I think I'm gonna try copying over a file again and going and seeing how hot that heat sink is getting still. All right, so we got a file transferring. And this heat sink is nearly cold. So I don't think we're gonna have any issues with that overheating. All right, so that NIC is nice and cold. This NIC is working. I think I'm gonna go ahead and swap out the Broadcom NIC for the little one that's in there, just to make sure that's working as expected and that we don't need to go buy another knock to a van or something. So let's do that. Oh yeah, this card didn't come with a tall bracket, so I uh, sort of made one. It's not pretty, but it works. And that's what matters, right? Oh, I dropped a screw on carpet and it's not magnetic. Well, that screw's gone forever. I think it'll be fine with one. All right, so I got the Broadcom card hooked up and as we can see here in our adapters, it is hooked up and working. Already got the IP address and everything sorted out. And if I try copying over, let's just try this short video really quick. All right. It's working. Let's see if we get the full one gigabyte or so. A little bit less. Yeah, so it's a little bit less than that other card. It's interesting. Not terrible though. I'm gonna go ahead and copy over Knives Out again just so it takes a while. I'm gonna see how hot this card gets. All right, so in my desktop, I have the Broadcom card installed here. It's booting up right now. You might be wondering why I'm not installing it in that other PCIe slot to give it a little bit more breathing room down here. But if I plug it into that slot, A, it gets really close to my GPU, which the fan hubs are really yellow and kind of gross. Anyway, it gets really close to the GPU if I put it in this one, but it also limits my GPU to only eight lanes because of this motherboard. So it's down in this bottom slot and I'm gonna see how warm these get. We'll see. There's a little bit of air coming off the power supply here that's not too warm. So maybe that'll help keep a little bit of airflow there. And there's a decent amount of airflow coming from these fans up front. So hopefully that'll be enough. Okay, yeah, so it's not nearly as hot as that other card was getting. It was a little warm, but it definitely wasn't like burning my fingers. So I think it's probably going to be fine without any active cooling. I think now I'm gonna go ahead and set up that QNAP NAS and get it hooked up and we'll play around with that. And then after that, we're pretty much done minus just some cleaning up.
Okay, so it's been a little bit. I didn't want to film everything because trying to film in that closet is a huge pain, but I did get the QNAP switch set up and installed and everything. And I'll talk more about that in my QNAP NAS video that I'll be doing here in a little bit, but I was able to get it working with the 10 gigabit card, so pretty cool. I also took a bit of time to straighten things up as I made a pretty big mess. And I also moved that gigabit switch in my office on top of the 10 gigabit switch and then tied them together. That way I have some more gigabit ports and have two and a half gigabit ports open for testing and such. All right, so I've got 10 gigabit working, but are there any caveats? Are there any issues? Well, I'm not a network expert by any means, but I noticed that there were no packet errors in the switch dashboard. And I also ran iperf multiple times without any sort of issues or packets dropped or anything like that. So it seems like it's pretty solid. I was only able to get around seven or eight gigabit per second when testing with iperf, but that still gave me around one gigabyte per second or so when not limited by drive speed. Now, obviously I probably need to make some upgrades to my NAS if I you know, don't wanna be limited by my drives, but that's for some later videos. So I think the takeaway from this whole video is that 10 gigabit is actually pretty affordable. I mean, okay, obviously I was sent that awesome $600 switch from QNAP, but if I wanted to do this more on a budget, I could have just bought two of the smaller switches that I got. And yeah, I'd only be limited to one 10 gigabit device on either side, but I'd still have that 10 gigabit link between for all the two and a half gig devices. Or I could buy one of the multitude of switches QNAP has or switches that you can get from other brands. Had I bought two of the smaller switches, it would have cost me a little less than $300. And then I think I spent around $50 total on the two NICs that I used for my TrueNAS server and my desktop. So realistically, you could get a small 10 gigabit network for under $350. Now, what's funny is I'm going to have a group of you that complain in the comments that this is completely overkill and unnecessary. And then I'm going to have another group of people that are going to complain that I didn't do things more optimally and that I need to get a bunch of I need to get NVMe flash storage and my NAS. And uh, I see truth to both sides of that, because realistically, for a lot of use cases, 10 gigabit networking is overkill and you're not going to see any real benefit. But for me, when I'm editing and trying to move footage back and forth, it is helpful. However, I do think I'm going to want to upgrade at some point, probably just adding more drives so I can more so take advantage of that 10 gigabit connection. As always, if there's anything that you think I could have done better, make sure to put it down in the comments below, because I love to learn from you guys. Also, huge thanks to QNAP for making this video happen by sending over their Switch and their NAS that, like I said, I'll be taking a look at in a future video. If you guys want to support the channel, you can always hit the subscribe button, the like button, all those things, but you can also check out my Patreon or YouTube member space where I have early access to videos behind the scenes. You can get your name mentioned at the end of videos. There's all sorts of little perks in there, so go check that out and maybe consider supporting me and what I'm doing. But I think that's about it. So thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.